I essentially lived in London. Uh, so everything I'm about to tell you, my career, what I do to earn money as a professional mountain guide, the man has climbed Everest 14 times, each time leading a paying client to the top. First ascent all over the world from South America, North America, the Himalayas. Nomination for the PLA door, climbing Oscar, here and winner, but beaten by the Russians. It's probably on some systematic doping system, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, first went to ski an 8,000 metre peak and went back and skied another 8,000 metre peak. There's only 14 uh, mountains in the world over 8,000 metres. I'm one of only four or five people to ski multiple 8,000 metre peaks. So, all of that. And this is aimed more at the people at the back that I was talking to earlier from the YouTube and were the young boy down there somewhere in the dark. I can't see now because the light's too bright in my eyes. Um, I, I, I'm really surprised that people don't fall off stages for me. <laughs> Are you insured for that? Where's it <laughs> um, it's, all of this, which I'm telling you about, is built upon a passion and a determination for the love of, of, of what I do. It's as simple as that. I mean, I didn't grow up climbing. I kind of fell into it. Uh, I found it when I was at university. Before that, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And in fact, to start with, I started out off like any other amateur climber. I just did it because it was fun. And it was only 15 years ago that I decided I better monetize this thing that I have meant to be pretty good at, and I became a professional mountain guy. And that again was something which I was really passionate about. <coughs> I mean, I, I'm such a firm believer that whatever it is that you do, I mean, I don't care what it is, maybe, maybe an artist, a banker, a dentist, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, potter, you, you've got to love what it is. Otherwise, you just end up wasting this amazing thing that we call life. You glitter it away. The other reason why I put this picture up is, is three things. One is to remind me to tell you about the name. Two, to let you know the secret about living in, in Slough. And three, and maybe, maybe some of you out there can help me on this. The ladies out there. Three, I forget sometimes. I'm a pretty handsome dude, aren't I? <laughs> left my notes at home earlier. So I, I asked the lovely girl Rhiannon where she had to print, uh, print some notes out for her which she sent through to her. And there, there, there's meant to be about 18 or 19 images and, and she's actually only given me six. <laughs> so, where's Rhiannon? Yeah, I, th I think you're sacked as a PA. <laughs> uh, I, I sent you through a load of So this, uh, this is going to be even more random than normal. So just bear with me on this one. Right. This this is what I'm most known for, taking people up and down Everest. I first went there in 2004, and I've been there pretty much every year since. And part of the story I'm going to take you on today is a little journey up and down Everest. But there's also going to be snippets, which I hope some of you may take home and go, yeah, that's actually, you know, I, I can learn from that. You know, especially the, the, some of the students at the top, if you're not falling asleep, and some of the DOE students at the back and, and people like that. And what I do, I've chatted to one or two people uh, out on the beautiful lawn earlier about the way that I professionally work on the mountain. I'm pretty unique in the way that I work. I work in a very bespoke one-on-one -on -one basis. And I give a very high level of service. And that level of service starts very early on. I, I'm really lucky. I'm really like, I don't advertise anyone. People find me. Now you, you go online, yes, I've got a website and stuff like that, but I don't actively push it. And the reason why I don't have to do that is because of our success rate. Our success rate on Mount Everest is about 84%. So getting people to the top and back down, 84%. Compared with an industry average of about 50, 52%. So we're way, way in advance of um, the industry average. But more than that, if you go back a bit, go back to the early years, go back to the 1920s when Manly and Irving were trying to climb Mount Everest. Um, if you look at, you know, since then, it's about 32% success rate on Everest. 
and we run at 84%. And one of the reasons why we're so successful is that very early on we set what it is we're trying to do. And generally somebody would come to me and say, hey, you know, keen on engaging your services, to, to you know, go to the mountains or whatever they do, sit down, have breakfast, supper, lunch, whatever with them, and they say, what is it that you want? And I said, well, we want to climb, I want to climb Mount Everest. I'm like, great, brilliant, but that's not what you're employing me for. I'm like, what? No, no, well, actually, what you're employing me for is to bring me through the front door at the end of the expedition. Whether we get to the top or not is kind of neither here nor there. Now, we go out to Everest and I have bloody excited, a really good time, a really great time on the mountain. It doesn't matter, but it shouldn't matter if we get to the top or not. The key thing is to come home again. Now, a very good friend of mine, Ed Beesters, an American client, very famously once said, getting to the top is optional, but getting back down is mandatory. And he's so, so right. Now, essentially what I'm saying is, you know, the journey is at least, if not more important than where you're trying to get to, the destination. Because more often than not, and I'll show you a picture, I think I've got a picture, later on, of the summit of Everest. It's a little bit underwhelming. But the whole thing is amazing. It's utterly amazing. And I set that vision very early on. That's what we're doing. We're going to go away to the mountains and have a rip roaring, safe, great time. And if we get summits along the way, there's a bonus. It's setting the goal and the vision and getting everybody invested on that on board. Has the um, as, as school done it? Every day, every day. No, and you think about it, it's, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Who's been to the ball? Who here? I know Derek has. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, okay, ask the lady there, where did you go? Can I do? Uh, going back 30 years, can't remember. Uh, sure, <laughs> you mean like 15 years. Uh, uh, but you probably went to the Annapurna's or maybe the other place. Yeah. We went to Sea Everest, but it was Maldi. Yeah, it was Maldi. Sorry, it's not about. You, you should have tacked into to Western. Look, look, look at the clouds in there. They, they were wild, it's going to rain. It, but it's an amazing place, isn't it? Yeah, it's an absolutely stunning place. And, um, this is it, this is what it looks like. So, generally, somebody said, I've been in every place now, and I'll be kind of not move across here, otherwise, um, I won't, won't be in camera, so sometimes that happens. But I won't have any. So, the, um, the eagle eyed monkey you might just see down in that corner, in good eyesight here, yeah? but you can see some yellow, and green, and red of tents. That's every space camp. That's 5,300 meters above sea level. And this is the Kumbu I saw, and the group goes behind the back there and comes up to the tippy top. Now, I'm going to be asking some questions. I know people don't like being asked questions at events like this, but there, there's some young people here who are used to being asked questions, and maybe they know. <laughs> Anybody know the height of Everest? Derek, you're not ever answer. <laughs> yes, just run it back. 8848 meters above sea level. Let's try and sort of put that into some sort of perspective. That's nearly nine kilometers. What's that in old money? What's that in old money? Well, we stopped using old money in 1972, I believe. We're in desert that. Nobody uses old money anymore. That's 29,300 feet in the Well, are well, you American? <laughs> You've got eight inches next, don't you? <laughs> yeah, about 29,300 feet. Uh, now, what's the plan for? Okay, nine kilometres. Nine kilometres. How far did you walk today, girls, on your DOE uh, bronze uh, assessment? 10.8k. Big pun? 10.8k. 10.8k. So, not that far. This is nine, nine k. You did 10.8k. So imagine that lifted up vertically into the sky. What does that look like? Yeah, you can't get your head around that, really. So the way that I always say to people, next time you're going on a holiday, you're on an aeroplane somewhere, when you get to cruising altitude, there or thereabouts, have a look outside the window. 
That's how high Everest is. That's properly high. That's my work environment. I professionally lead people into the death zone. Now, climb is a pretty simple phone. Is that right, Derek? <laughs> yeah, okay, it's mine, and, and, and those are bad. Climbers, I mean, are we're pretty simple. And we use this term, the death zone. And what's the death zone? Well, the death zone is an area of the atmosphere above which, well, in which, human beings are not supposed to be. There's not enough. I say oxygen, there's never going to be some physicist in the school who's like, eh, that's not quite right. And you actually, you know, it's air pressure. The air density is so low, it can't sustain human life. So it's very simple to put, as human beings, you start to die. Hence the term death zone. Okay, and how long you have is an unknown quantity, a ticking time bomb. And that's my working environment. It's above about seven, seven and a half thousand metres upwards. So it's really dangerous. Added into that, there's no Brecon Mountain Rescue. <laughs> uh, you can't call those guys up 999 and get, get through. Yeah, I like Mountain Rescue, please. Long way for them to come from Brecon. And added to that, you can't get a helicopter up there. Now, you can't expect a rescue above well, the highest ever rescue that's 7,900 metres from an anaphern on a long run. So there's like a, a uh, wire cord underneath that cuts some of it off. They did land a helicopter on the summit once, but it's totally stripped down, an uh, Airbus B3E, totally stripped down, did the pilot, just put a skid down, and that, that, that was it. You can't affect this. And the reason why I'm telling you all this is very simple. That when we get up there, we are very much on our own. And the consequences of our own actions, we are responsible for. And you have to be very understanding about that. The, you know, the actions of the girls in the back, they're sorry to keep picking you out. But you know, the, you know, the, the consequences of your actions today on your Duke of Edinburgh bronze, if you've gone the wrong way, it's kind of down to you to work it out a little, a little bit. You can't always phone up uh, the mountain rescue and things like that and you know, hope that they affect rescue. You need to be understanding about, so, as I say, the consequences. Now, Everest is like any other hill. No, it's like, it's like, it's like um, Penny Fat. Just happens to be a little bit bigger. You kind of approach it in the same way. There's a series of obstacles that you need to overcome. You need to find solutions. It's pretty simple, really. You know, when people say to me, well, you know, try and describe your job as a mountain guy. I'm a project manager. I think so. I'm a project manager. It's a series of, of problems, and you have a client, and you need to navigate that client through these series of problems to get to the top and back down again safely. Is that not what a project manager does, pretty much? Just I do in a really glamorous place. Not bad view, is it, from my office? Anyway, the first obstacle that we need to find something through is, um, is this thing here. It's, it's the Kubla Weiser, the river of ice, the glacier. Anyone does geography here? Girls do geography? You want to glass your arm? Yeah? Yes? No, okay, yes, yeah, right. Uh, some of them have trekked on them, I know Derek probably falling in crevasses. Some of the speed on them, etc., etc. This is quite a complex glacier. And you need to find a way through it. And generally, falling into crevasses is not a cool thing. You try to avoid it by going around them. But sometimes you can't go around them. And when you can't go around them, well, we very simply go over them. Ooh. A new triple seven out of this. Oh. One of the biggest ones we uh, come across. Oh, they're not the ladders. They're not Oh, that looks safe, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, my word, it's enormous. So these are that is fairly well positioned. step out the door and take risks willy nilly. Everything we do is calculated. 
biggest issue that I have with the ice wall is, uh, is the ladders. You know, we get these ladders that we should span across some of the some of the bigger crevasses that can't find a way around. And despite that this is what my ninth straight year, so I must have crossed these ladders dozens and dozens of times. I still don't like them. I still don't feel comfortable with them. You get on them and you're holding these little bits of rope and your feet and your cramp on feet are tinking across the runs. You look down and some of these things are just bottomless. Absolutely bottomless. And oof, for me, I, I've, I've never felt comfortable with them in, in all the time. <coughs> Nothing you can do to take away the danger. It is a dangerous thing. But we kind of like the little buzz of the blending that comes with this. But statistically, it's not as dangerous as some of the other parts of the race. So the amazing thing, I'm not going to talk about statistics, don't worry. The um, amazing thing about those ladders, they come from being <laughs> <laughs> That is a standard being cute ladder. That's all it is, and they're strung together. Now, I used to be a Boy Scout. I used to love Boy Scouts. Anybody else say Boy Scout, Girl Guide, that sort of stuff? Yeah, I used to love Boy Scouts. Now, did you have a look at, did you see that when those ladders were going across those crevasses, did you see the knots on them? Whoever tied those knots was clearly never a Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> that was never about to turn two and a half inches or, or whatever it is that we used to use to track and turn. Now, I don't know why, the image didn't come up earlier. I'd love to stand in front of you and say, wow, uh, I've climbed Everest 14 times, uh, done all these amazing things, all these ski descents, I'm a fully qualified mountain guy, a rock climbing really good standard, I must be amazing. But I'm not, really. And the reason why I say that is because I, in a way, I've been quite clever. In fact, I, I, I'm going to openly steal a, a quote from Andrew Carnegie. Yeah, the great Scottish industrials. So Andrew Carnegie famously wrote down his own epitaph. And on it, he wrote something along the lines of, I was clever enough to surround myself with people cleverer than I. And that's exactly what I've done throughout my career. And the reason why I tell you that is, I'm very lucky that on Everest, we have an amazing team of shirts. I don't know why I don't have an image of what I've won here. Clearly, it was. I don't know why I was doing what I was doing. Anyway, um, and my team of Sherpas, I believe, are among the best on that mountain. They are absolutely unbelievable. Back in their history, there used to be a trading nation. They used to trade between you know, Chinese, Tibet, and China, and, and India. So they, they, on one hand, are a yes culture. Now they, they have to say yes to trade and, and, and do this to, to earn a living. But more than that, they still live in very tight communities. They are all about community. They're all about the values that that bring to them. And they are all about family. And I think that brings something very special to the individual. Because all of a sudden, it's not about the individual. Which our society, I believe in. So we look with two focus on the individual. They are the collective, they are the community. And that brings something out within these people. They are beautiful, beautiful people. But more than that, on the mountain, they are powerhouses. The Sherpas have an unbelievable capacity for work. And that's a really interesting thing when you think about it. And people always ask me, well, what is it about the Sherpas? What makes them so good in the mountain? Uh, they must have a, a, an extra gene, or they must have a capacity, you know, their body must be better at absorbing oxygen than ours. Or, and this is perhaps pointed more at the younger people, or do they just work harder? Do they have a harder work ethic? Dorji, my number one Sherpa, is an amazing man. He used to walk an hour and a half to school every single day. Hour and a half there, hour and a half back. From the age of about three or four, he would carry water to and from the well in Pangrosha. He lives in a tiny village called Pangrosha. Now it's, I don't know, about eight days walk from the nearest road. No cars there. 
So from a very early age, he's been doing hard work. And he's not afraid of hard work. Now whatever it is that we're doing, don't, don't, don't shy away from that work, hard work. When we're climbing in the mountains, and this can give you an idea. When we're climbing the mountains, we wake up in the morning, and we, we're going to climb, let's say, Nutsi. There's mountain behind me, there's Nutsi. Uh, 19, no, I climbed in 2013 with a um, lovely Spaniard man. Alright, Spaniard man? Spaniard man. <laughs> well, actually, he's from Catalonia. Bit pedantic about that, he's like, I don't know. Anyway, give you an idea. You wake up in the morning, say 1 o'clock in the morning, you normally leave quite a bit early in the morning before the snow show. And the first thing you do is turn the stove on. Because what you have to do, you have to start melting snow into water. And then boil it up to make a porridge. We do eat porridge, okay, in the hills. If the girl is bending out having porridge for a while. And you've got to melt it. And it takes, you know, it's hard work. It takes a long time. It might take two hours of doing all that tense stuff, melting water, having breakfast, getting enough water in your plants for the day. That's hard work. But you know what? If you don't do it, you're not going to climb that mountain. Don't ever shy away from hard work. We think too much in this day and age that you know, these entrepreneurs, the dot com startups, or whatever, they're, they're shortcuts, they're hacks to success. Well, guess what? They're not. You, as the individual, as a collective, as a community, you still got to work hard to do these things. And it's exactly the same on the mountain. And I think that the Sherpas just have a harder work ethic, they have a higher pain threshold. Working in the mountains. You give, uh, I like to think myself quite fit too. I run every day, I'm in the gym every day, I've you know, got an ergo, a rowing machine thing at home, whatever it is. I'm quite a fit dude. I, uh, Georgie leaves me for dead. He's carrying like a third of a kilo rucksack. How, how heavy was your rucksack today, girls? Was that very? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it with 30 kilos. It would smoke me going down the mountain. And I've got this guy, little, uh, little mountain. These guys are awesome. So, yeah, I don't know why I'm a fish one, but I, yeah, I can't thank them enough. The reason we're so successful on Everest is because of their hard, hard work. They are amazing. Absolutely amazing. Right, luckily for Rihanna, I've got, a, I've got an old copy in my bag. Do you have Rihanna? <laughs> Lots of images on that one and on your six. Why don't we get to it? So, this is what Everest looks like. Another question I'm going to put out there. Does anybody know, Derek? <laughs> everybody know what rock type Everest is? <laughs> okay, well, what does it look like? Granite. Granite. No, it's not granite. This is, this, this is like one of granite. This is a like granite intrusion down here. Not granite. Sedimentary. Okay, we're getting closer. Limestone. Limestone. Well done, sir. Limestone. Same as down here. Limestone. Now, little people. There's some little people about here. Some over there. You can quite engage in. When does limestone start its life? Okay, someone said C. You know who said that? You're not a little person down the front there. Okay, oh, yeah, it starts its life bottom of the sea. And now it's the top of the world. Oh, come on, do you not find that amazing? <laughs> yeah, those actually said you'd be an engaging audience tonight. Like, come on, work with me here. We're going to be here all night otherwise. Do you not find that amazing? Yeah! 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 I was lucky enough, I went to university, I worked really hard at school. I wasn't particularly good at school, I'm not naturally gifted at, at anything. But it's that diligence again, I diligently uh, sort of worked my way through school, got to university. And uh, I studied geology, rocks and minerals. Obvious, some would say. And um, we used to have to read these geological papers by a guy called Dr. Mike Searle from Oxford University. He also happened to be a client. 
know, so there used to read these papers and it's you know, pretty turgid and boring and it's something you have to do on the job. Anyway, fast forward about 20 years, I get this email from Dr. Mike Searle saying that they're doing this project on Everest and would I mind collecting rock samples for him from the top of the world? It's amazing how these things will come out. So you can Google it, uh, how the earth was made. And there's me tapping away with a little jolly little shh, shh, shh. So I've got a gun here. What happened there? So I, you said, oh my goodness. There we go. Whoa, that was trippy, wasn't it? Um, yeah, so me tapping away with a little jolly little hammer. And we brought the rock samples back to Oxford University. Mike Sir was there. We cut these thin samples, tiny wee things, put them under the microscope, and you can see sea fossils in the rock. How cool is that? Really? I think it's cool. I don't care about you, Mark. I think it's cool. Right, okay, I'll put these photos up here to remind me of something, and uh, oh, that's it. Take nothing away from me. Actually, this guy I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, Richard, uh, his guide was on Elvis last, uh, last week. Has anybody seen the film, The Man That Skied Everest? No. Okay, so go home and Google it. It's amazing. Okay, don't get the hour and a half long. I did get a five minute bridge version. Okay, let's put all the highlights in. Imagine the scene. I think it's 1974, maybe. 1974. So the climate Everest in 1974 was properly hard. I mean, there's only a handful of people have done it. People were dying all the time. Now, more so than this year, 11 people have lost their lives in this year. I'm not being flippant about it, but back then, the death rate was like, off the charts. So it really held this aura about him. And then all of a sudden, there's this little man called Mr. Muir. It's a Japanese man. And he's got this vision that what he wants to do is ski down Everest. <laughs> I mean, my goodness, who are here skis? So I ski. I'm a ski guy, among other things. Okay, so the girls at the back of ski. Does that look like a logical ski man? <laughs> no. Of course it doesn't. It looks insane. But Mr. Muir's got his vision. Now, back in the 1970s, 74, so let's say, Nobody had ever skied an 8,000 metre peak, let alone ski Mount Everest. All his mates and his colleagues were going, what are you? Stupid. <laughs> you want to ski down Mount Everest? Are you nuts? That's impossible. Well, let's just take a step back, shall we? What does impossible mean? No, if you look it up in the dictionary, what does it say? Come on, okay, it's the opposite of possible. Now we will agree on that. Impossible is the opposite of what's possible. Yep? Yeah. But where do you stand if nobody has ever tried to do it? Why was that? Is it impossible? No. Of course it's not. It's a maybe. Oh, okay, well it's a maybe. But it's not, it's not impossible. It's not impossible at all. So then Mr. Muir, all his mates are going, it's impossible, but Mr. Muir's like, ha ha, I don't think so, I'm going to give it a go. Now luckily, like the girls at the back there, he thought it was all that from us again. Not very good with technology. <laughs> luckily, he thinks the ski from here probably isn't that logical. He's going to whip the edges out of the ski, so he's going to go from here. This is the South Pole of Everest, 8,000 metres above sea level, still fully in the desert. There it is, get, 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 get the little video. It's pretty dramatic. There, it's got like hot mask on, <laughs> big goggles, he pulls them down, and pushes himself to the edge. In the 70s, he's got these skis which are like ludicrously long. <laughs> They're really thin, ludicrously long skis. So take your eyes out, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, they like eating. Mr. Muir, it's tiny. And these skis are like two and a half meters. Like, I don't know what you're sitting on. Anyway, at the South Pole, what happens? It's the highest camp on Everest. Camp four. And literally, it's flat, like it is here. And then you get to the edge, and it pretty much goes, woohoo, straight down, like it is here. Straight down here. This is the lowest place on Everest. I put that into context, so that's about 1,800 vertical meters. That's pretty big. And the average German, I swear, who's that over there? Jesus is in here. He's up there somewhere. 
The average angle of that is about 55 degrees. Steeping is down here at about 70, 75, even 80 degrees. Let's just put that into some more context. Your average black rock is about 30 to 35 degrees. Average angle. This is 55. <laughs> this is proper steep ski. Now part of my job as a fully qualified mountain guide, I don't just go up mountains and we've established I ski down. And part of my job sometimes is to ski with clients in steep couloirs on a steep ground. Part of my job I don't really like. Yeah, but we all have that. Now who, who here, little people? So you're really rude calling you little people. What do you call students? <laughs> young people. Young people, there we go. Is, is that what you see? Young people. <laughs> They don't try it, they make it like young people. <laughs> uh, young people! Sorry. I'm just amusing myself. Um, and I'm also playing a football game. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, so who here likes school? I loved school when I was growing up. I absolutely adored school. <laughs> Headmistress, nobody's putting their hands up. <laughs> there we go, so a few hands going up. Okay, but I bet there are aspects of school that you don't like. Yeah, there's aspects of my job, I love my job, I deeply adore my job, but there are aspects that I don't like. Like there are aspects of school that you won't like. But you know what? Suck it up. <laughs> I, I, mean, I honestly mean it, suck it up. Because by the time you get into a private, or life in general, there will be parts that aren't quite tickety boo. But you've got to go through those. You do, you have to go through those to really appreciate the other parts of life. If everything was marvellous all the time, there'd be no context to it. I don't like, in fact, I, I, I actively dislike skiing steep ground with clients. It scares me, it makes me feel incredibly nervous, I get stressed over it, but it's something I, uh, you know, it's part of my job, so I do it, I suck it up. And when we ask skiing steep ground, you normally go something like this. You know, you've got a steep core and you're looking at it, oh god, I'm stressed again. And you drop into it with your clients, you brief them, you drop into it, and the first thing you try to do is ski cut it, see if it's going out of line. Yeah, so you, you ski cut it, you ski it one at a time normally, ski cut it, it doesn't have a line, might do a couple of jump turns, get a feel for the snow, open up and ski the core and then bring the clients up. That's generally how we do it, safest way of doing it. Probably some here. Mr. Muir pushes himself through the edge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, five minute bit. He pushes himself straight over the edge, straight into his feet. And he accelerates down this thing. He accelerates down this thing like a like a Japanese bullet train. <laughs> Sorry, sir, that's not there. What was that? Uh, 6,000 feet. <laughs> but it's got a plan, and this is the best part of it. God, I love Mr. Muir. It's got a plan. And strapped to his back, he's got a parachute. <laughs> and he opens up the parachute, thinking it's going to slow him down. Brilliant idea. Unfortunately for Mr. Muir, he clearly didn't pay attention in physics class. Because at 8,000 meters above sea level, the air density is so low that the parachute doesn't actually do anything. <laughs> it simply accelerates even faster, and now we've got this thing which is destabilizing and trapping his flight in the power. Meanwhile, all these mates down the bottom here, the whole Japanese crew, I don't know, maybe the cultural thing or the era, they're all smoking. They're like 7,000 meters, all smoking cigarettes.
doing really cool stuff like this. Now that may not be cool for you, but there will be something that's cool for you. Whatever it is, it does happen that my Everest is Everest. Your Everest is possibly going to be something different. But it's finding it. And then just deep diving into it. This is coming around the Geneva Spur on Everest. A little bit of Everest history for you. There it is, you might not. <laughs> you know why it's called a Geneva Spur? There it is, I bet you do. Probably the Swiss one bit first. No, oh, there you go, it's you. Uh, so 1952, a little bit of Everest history. Back in 1856, Everest was known as Peak 15. And then the great Indian, Indian trigonomic survey, survey reconciled it to be the highest peak in the world. And in honour of the Surveyor General, Sir George Everest, his uh, successor named Everest Everest. Quite arrogant of the Brits in a way to just scrub the history of the local people. And the locals were called the Chumanunga, or Sakamasa, Mother Goddess of the Earth. So although the Sherpas and the Tibetans didn't know it's the highest mountain, there was something special about it regardless. You wouldn't call it Mother Goddess of the Earth otherwise. But of course the name Everest stuck. And uh, the Brits were the first to attempt climb Everest in 21, 22 and 24, then into the, into the 30s. Then I think it was 49, high over the wall obviously. Uh, 49 I think with the reconnaissance strip, the way they fit the reconnaissance strip. Um, <coughs> And then all of a sudden, this is back in the day, only one team was allowed to climb the mountain at any one time. One team from one country. There weren't multiple teams like there are today. And um, the Swiss, in 1951, applied for permission to climb in 1952. And the Nepalese government gave them permission. And then the British found out. And the British were outraged. They're like, oh! How dare they? What do you think they're doing? This is our mountain. And they go, we called it Everest. It's our mountain. But nobody told the Swiss that. I mean, mountains don't belong to anybody, do they? So that arrogance and complacency of the British, just assuming that nobody else would go to their mountain. But nobody told the Swiss. The Swiss applied for permission, they got permission. The British were outraged. They lobbied the Swiss government, they lobbied the Nepalese government, to no way. And the Swiss went there. They were the first to climb to the south pole of Everest, coming around this spot, calling it the Geneva Spur. First to get to 8,000 meters on the south side of Everest. They got to 8,800, no, 8,550 meters. 300 meters. About 500 feet, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, that bit, that's about you. Closer to a thousand. 300 meters. Sounds better, 1,000 feet, 300 meters from the top. I mean, how close is that? I mean, this mountain is nearly nine kilometers. 300 meters is nothing. I wonder sometimes how history would be different if the Swiss had got there. Tita got to the high point and Lambert and Tenzing, the same shirt for Tenzing that was there in 53. Lambert and Tenzing, 8,550 meters, breaking their altitude level set in 19. Uh, by British. But they did get that. And of course, you know, 29th of May 1953, the British did get that. And one of the reasons why I'm telling you this, again, this is you know, perhaps more for the younger people. You know, it's a very obvious sort of metaphor in a way. Is what happened is the British, they were complacent and arrogant in what, in, in arrogant in what they were doing. They just assumed something would happen. And of course, it didn't. Because something else came along. The Swiss came along. Now, don't let complacency ever slip into what you're doing. You have to be amazing at what you do. And to become amazing, you need to be comfortable in that environment. Now, because if, if you're frightened of something, you, know, you can't really excel at that. So, so be comfortable in what you do. But the danger with being comfortable is that complacency seeps in. And what follows complacency is being mediocre. And you're not at this school to be mediocre. Even the sound of that word, mediocre, it doesn't sound very nice, does it? <laughs> no, it really. I don't think so anyway. But it's great to have come from places. I'm really lucky in my job. If complacency sleeps into my job, somebody normally ends up dying. Now, you might think, well, that doesn't sound very good. But that keeps me sharp, keeps the team sharp. 
Because if we let our guard down, it goes badly wrong. We don't go from excellent, like the headmistress here, to average. Now, we don't have that luxury. We get it wrong in the mountains, we become complacent in the mountains, and the mountains will turn around and bite us, and generally frostbite, you know, fingers fall off, ears fall off, or worst case, somebody dies. Complacency has no place. It, 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 no place in professional or uh, personal life. Yeah. Oh, 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 yes, here we go. Now, you probably saw in the press recently lots of cues on Everest. Yeah, it's quite topical at the moment. Well, this picture, this picture is taken in almost exactly the same spot as the pictures from uh, Ninsberg, the, uh, the Sherpa guy that took that photograph that you would have seen in the press. Now, in that photograph, there's about 200 people. In this photograph, you can see one, two, three, Four, five, and probably one, two, three, six, seven, and a few nasty. Call it maybe a dozen people. Now, I, I get really sad in my photographs like that because it's not necessarily a true reflection on the mountain. You can still find adventure on Everest. I mean, you get slammed by, by so many climbers. They say, oh, Everest is a real climb, and Everest is this, Everest is that. But it is still a wonderfully glorious place. People tell me that Everest is just a walk. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be taking the dog up there. <laughs> if you go off this side, that's the corn knees by the way, if you go down hanging mushroom and snow, you sit on that, it doesn't have to off. And if you go up, you go down 3,000 meters, pushing 10,000 feet, uh, down to Chinese Tibet. And if you go down this side, it's about 2,500 or so, down to the Western. Count two on Everest. Not a place to fall. This is as glorious, this is as wonderful as any of the Swiss ridges. Switzerland is famed for its amazing alpine ridges. This, I just think, is this is what we do it for. Simple as that. When people ask me, why do you do it? Well, there's lots of reasons why I do it. It gives me space to think. Yeah, I engage with you know, my Sherpa friends. Now, I love the wide open space that the mountains give me, that sense of freedom, the reality. We don't live in reality here. I believe mountains represent reality more than Western society. But this is part of it. I mean, look at it. how beautifully gorgeous is this. It's just unbelievable. But by the time we get here, it's about 8,700 metres above sea level. And the first thing that occurs when you start your brain of oxygen is it affects your ability for rational thought. So your cognitive thinking is affected. Which is quite ironic really, because at 8,000 odd meters, this is the exact time that you need your thinking to be absolutely spot on. You're making time critical decisions that have far reaching consequences. Get it wrong, at best you're not going to sum it, but someone's going to die. Okay? And what I employ is something called binary thinking. Very simple. Binary thinking. Binary. Black, white, one, zero. It doesn't get any simpler than that, does it? And what binary thinking is, I'm a man. Okay? Yeah, I'm sorry, gentlemen, but you know, it's, it, it's true. We can't multitask. We can't hold multiple things in our brain at any one time. Let alone at 8,000 meters. Especially me. Yeah, I'm a bit stupid. Yeah, my brain is not big enough. At 8,000 meters, the only thing I'm concerned about is auction levels. What the client's like, where the client is, how the Sherpa team are, where the Sherpa team are, where the conditions, under book conditions, levels of oxygen. Levels of oxygen twice, because that's my biggest single concern. That's all I'm concerned about. Seven or eight things. They're the only things I'm concerned about. I don't care about anything else. Nothing. Binary thinking. Cut all the fluff and the noise out. These decisions are so critical, they've got to be absolutely correct. And unfortunately, in this day and age, there's so much noise around us from our smartphones, from our email inbox pinging and this and that, that we can't actually concentrate on meaningful things. So we've got to cut the noise out. 
And that's what I do up here. I cut the noise out. I don't care about my tax return. I don't care about you know, the VAT or my car tax. I don't, even, I don't even care about my children or wife. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's not their capacity. If I start making emotional decisions at 8,000 metres, not logical ones, chances are I'm going to make the wrong decision. At 8,000 metres, South on Willoughby, they've got no place there. I don't have the capacity to think about them and make the right decisions. And I'm just going to show you a little video from last year, 2018. 2018, I was looking after Ben Fogel on Everest. And everything was going hunky dory. We were well prepared. Uh, I spent two years working with him, he's a friend of mine, and we got high on the mountain. I always say, control the controllables. Keep careful control of what you can control. Does that make sense? Because there's so much in life that we can't control. We've got no, you know, no control on it. You, know, you come to school and so much is going to happen at school that you can't do. Don't worry about that. No, don't, don't put energy into that, girls. Don't, just, just control, be conscious of what you can control. And that's genuinely your attitude. Okay, that's the one thing we've got complete control of in our lives. How we approach ourselves, how we approach life within ourselves. Okay, that's the one thing we have complete control of. But control, control the controllables. Control the controllables really well. It allows space for us to manoeuvre when the uncontrollables happen. And unfortunately with Ben, last year, we had an episode of the uncontrollable. And this is what it was. Ooh. My entire Everest dream is hanging in the balance. My regulator fails, leaving me without oxygen. During his past 12 summits, Kenton has never seen such a catastrophic failure. We have no spares. I feel helpless, but Kenton draws on experience and acts quickly. Ben takes three cylinders, I take three cylinders, and can you give Ben your regulator? And we will go back to South Coast. Sherpa Ming Dorji agrees to give me his regulator and bottle, and he returns to Camp 4 without oxygen. His heroic actions save the expedition and allow the team to continue towards the summit high above. As we ascend, dawn breaks to reveal the beauty below. The summit now feels within our reach, and then the unthinkable happens. This time, it's our cameraman, Mark Fisher, whose regulator fails. A potentially life-threatening situation, far from rescue. While Mark puts the camera down, Kenton and Sherpa Antindu race to help him. You're just broken. Get Kenneth before. Kenneth, what more? Kenneth, you are taking that oxygen going down, Kenneth. You've done a great job, but we need to go on. Can you? Thank you. Be careful right now. As the drama unfolds, I'm left isolated above them, perched on the side of Everest, alone. It's both beautiful and unnerving. Right, quick update. It is about 4.30 in the morning. Um, there's been a problem with the regulators. Mine went, and then Mark's just went. So I'm here, and I'm just going to show you my view. There's the sun, about to come up. There's the sun, it's right there. So I'm really not too far away. It's a bit scary here, if I'm to be honest. I'm waiting for Kenton, Mark and the surface to come. How are you doing, man? Okay, Kenton. Reunited, our team carry on ever higher on the exposed shoulder of the mountain.
over the famous Hillary Stem. The summit is just 120 meters away. Teetering between China to my right and Nepal to my left. Suddenly, that unmistakable sound again. My replacement regulator also fails and my oxygen disappears into the thin air. The whole thing. Take, 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 mask off. There's yours now. Did you need to turn that? No, no, no. You're within about 15 minutes of the top. Remember, it's China, isn't me. They kick this man's ass. Come on. It's a brave decision, leaving Kenton no oxygen for the summit. Right, so quite a lot going on there. We're just going to sort of jump into that very, very quickly. Little uh, young people need to go home and go to bed and things like that. So, first and foremost, did you see how totally, totally just selflessly the, the sheriffs were? No. Yeah, immediately just sort of, hey, yeah, have our delivery systems, we'll go down, sacrificing their own sites. Now, to put it into context, that uh, the sheriffs get paid the summit bonus, they get paid that regardless, but summits make them more employable. Okay, the more summits they have, the more employable and the more uh, way, you know, higher wage they can provide. So that is an amazing sacrifice for them. But they're doing it because it's a collective. Now, they are part of something bigger than the individual. They're part of a team. And we're there for Ben. You know, their plan is to get Ben up and down that mountain. So that's first and foremost. Secondly, that is what I would call crisis management. Okay? The uncontrollables were the regulators. The regulators on top of the oxygen bottles, the regulators were failing. Never seen a failure like it before. So those bottles contain something like four and a half thousand litres of pure compressed oxygen. And it disappeared in the atmosphere in about 1.5 seconds. Gone. Because an O-ring exploded inside the regulators. There is nothing that we ever could have done to control that. That is an uncontrollable. All you can do is draw back into experience. That's crisis management. First and foremost, isolate the other controller. And in that case, it was Ben. We love Ben. Everybody loves Ben. There's Ben Food. He didn't want to give him a big pop. He's got like three dogs and two wonderful children, blah, blah, blah. Everybody loves Ben. I love Ben. He's a friend of mine. But Ben is a very emotional person. Okay, in that situation, emotion has no place. So we isolated Ben, that's why he sat on his own. He can't add anything to that situation. All he's going to do is dilute what's happening. Get rid of Ben, isolate Ben into motion. Over there, mate. Okay, go and take some nice pretty pictures and do whatever you do on Instagram. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, we dive in and just try to sort out what's going on and find a solution. Now, in crisis management, the first thing that disappears is productivity. And the first thing that always goes in crisis situations, productivity. Now, how do you keep it in this case? Is like the summit. The summit, four other teams that day experienced the same oxygen delivery failures. We were the only team at summit. Everybody else turned around. We found a solution. Yeah, the solution is drawing on experience. Is having that team who work together to the common goal and collective. A common goal as a collective. It's not about the individual. And it's clear communication. If this is what we're going to do, logical binary thinking to find a solution. And then finally, we go, well, what on earth were you doing giving your own delivery system to Ben? Well, Ben was never going to make it down without one. Now, I've got years and years and years of high altitude experience. More than that, I've got personal confidence in what I do. Would you consider for the boy from Slough, where we first started from, and my family said they weren't climbers. Uh, I didn't go to the Alps until I was 18. I didn't ski until I got 22, 23. But that passion inside me for climbing has meant that over the years I've built that experience and the confidence. I knew down here that I could get up and down 
from where we had that last failure to the top and back down again safely. More than that, I also had bends of safety to the remaining Sherpas of the camera, who also happened to be a mountain guy. So uh, I, to an extent, you know, took, took myself out of the equation because I didn't have an option delivery system. Yeah, and you can criticise that to your heart's content, but the bottom line is, on that day, it worked. It was a logical, workable solution. Now, yeah, and above all, there was something. Ooh, hang on, hang on there. Don't mind that. I think that's tea enough for the... Okay, so I'm going to leave you with one. I'll just go back one. You see me, I don't know she's gone. She, she's so embarrassed, she's left. <laughs> I, see, I don't have it on there. Don't know my slides there that well. Okay, so I'm going to give you one last little thing. I think that's the next one. It's a little video. And it's a little video of a, a little film, a 40 minute film that we shot a couple of years ago going to uh, every place. Okay, and it's a little bit of a left field thing, but I'm, I'm going to very quickly tee it up for you. Um, and then you can all go home and go to the pub or whatever you want to do. A bit bored of me talking. This isn't a posh call, it's a you're far too polite. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of years ago I got a telephone call. And I answered the phone, and the number from uh, America. And this guy goes, no, is that Kenton? I'm like, yeah, 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 it's Kenton, yeah, who is it? And um, the guy goes, I'm Paul Oakenfold. That's all right. It's Paul Oakenfold. Now, for those of you who don't know, Paul Oakenfold is a DJ. He's an electronic DJ. Back in the early 90s, he was probably the biggest DJ in the world. The first international superstar DJ. He was massive. Still is massive. Had to be a bit of a hero. Yeah, a bit of a hero. He's Paul Oakenfold. Like, you, you're kidding. No, 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 no. Listen, uh, I hear you're the man, and uh, I, I want to throw a like, dance party at every space camp. <laughs> I'm like, you are kidding. <laughs> and in the back of my mind, I think, this doesn't resonate with anything that is you know, wholesome to me. You, know, you, you, you want to throw a dance party at every. He goes, yeah. I'm like, no. Are you kidding? He's like, well, why not? And I'm like, no, no, I was about to put the phone down. And I can hear him go, no, 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 don't put the phone down. It turns out I wasn't actually the first person he called. <laughs> but I was the first person that listened to it. About an hour later, and he put the phone down, finally, I got it. it. Wasn't so much throwing a dance party, that's that was part of it. What he wanted to do is travel to Nepal, find out about local culture and music, what it is that's important to the Sherpas, how the Sherpas move to the music, how the music is handed down, how they make music. Why is music important to them? He wanted to raise a quarter of a million US dollars for charity, which was mainly ploughed back into educational, mainly music charity. He donated all the speaker system and the sound system to the Tango Chain Monastery. The monks had somehow blown up their own sound system. <laughs> so the monks now have a complete state of the art DJ system. <laughs> Go figure that out. But above all, there was a man who wanted to take himself out from his own comfort zone and do something he'd never done before. And after I put the phone down, it struck me that this was exactly the same as Mr. Muir. <laughs> Everybody's telling you you can't do it. You're a DJ, you're overweight, you used to smoke, you drink too much. You, know, you can't play a dance party at face camp. He says, not the dumb thing, it's impossible. But we've already seen today what impossible actually means. And it doesn't mean anything unless you actually try. And that's what Paul did. And we put together this thing called Soundtrack. And this is just a very short teaser that just shows you a little bit what it was all about. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> God, I teed that up so wonderfully, didn't I? God, I hate myself sometimes. But it's better again. We know it will be lovely, and then you're all shabby and. We do like that, actually. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. But this is Paul, and this.
And I, I always make a point of never answering critics or, or naysayers on social media and stuff like that. I, mean, I, just, I just don't have the bandwidth or the inclination or time to, uh, to get involved with. But my wife said, no, I think you need to write something about what happened. If people say, I think it's atrocious, it's terrible, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and my, my response was in a way, well, if it's a string quartet playing bar, everybody goes, oh, so beautiful. Oh, yes, the mountains are bar. Wow. Yes, but it was absolutely no different. It just happened to be a different genre of music. But there was somebody who pushed himself, somebody that pushed himself outside the envelope. And once you explain what he was doing, everybody goes, ah, I get it. You know, we left no trace. We didn't leave any rubbish, we took everything away, we raised all the money for charity. Yeah, we didn't hurt anybody. So where's the heart in doing something as amazing as that? Now, in, in my mind, there, there is no harm. I mean, as long as you're sort of understanding, the Sherpas loved it. The Sherpas saw it the most amazing thing they've ever seen. <laughs> you know, they, they, they couldn't get their heads around it, they danced longer and harder than anybody else. And I suppose that's the thing I'm, I'm trying to say. You, know, you go to these wonderful places and you need to be tolerant and understanding about the, the cultures of the people that you go into. And I'm so proud to have been part of that. And I suppose it comes down to the fact that, and again to, to, to the younger people out there, listen. Give people time to put their opinions across before you cast judgment. And I'm guilty of it, I'm very nearly guilty of Paul. And I would have missed out on this amazing opportunity to share that experience with him, to be part of what is soundtrack. And now I've got a beautiful new friend in Paul, and we'll be going out to visit him uh, LA uh, next month. And that only came across, uh, only came, came through opening my ears and spending time listening with him.